So, uh, like Paul said, I work at the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. I work in the budget office. And my main job is to advise the executive leadership of the agency and policy decisions or budget decisions and things like that. So I'm often presenting to the uh, state elected, statewide elected state superintendent of public instruction for Wisconsin, Dr. Tony Evers, and then his appoint, political appointees to the executive leadership of the agency. And I, when I was thinking about what I should present to you, I thought, okay, well, I have a lot of opinions about visualization. Um, everyone does who works in visualization, but that's not really what's interesting. I'm gonna show you five graphs that I've actually worked with DPI's leadership on. And we're gonna talk about what kinds of principles are embodied by these graphs. So they've actually been seen by the state superintendent, every, every one of them. And so we're, we'll keep, have that in the back of your head as context for how you can use data visualization to communicate with leaders about very complicated data issues uh, and what data can do for you. Um, so, you know, we have sometimes principles. This one hangs above my desk. Know thy data and know thy audience better. Uh, I think, you know, knowing your data is crucial. That's the tool you got to work with. But when you are, are working with leaders, you have to know what they need and what their interests are and what, what their challenges are. And I have a series of questions that I always ask, and I find it very interesting that these questions apply both to the data and to the people. And they're really useful. So what is their question? There could be the data or the people. What are, you need to answer that for both of them. What is their time frame? So often with leaders, time frame is short. And the data may be long-looking long data or very short-term data, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, what are their constraints? With leaders, it can be things like time, energy, uh, political realities. Uh, with data, it can be the measurement of the, the tool or the capacity we have to analyze it. And what is their capacity? So uh, what are our leaders' abilities? What are their backgrounds? What are their trainings? And what are their interests? And what is the data's background? Where did it come from? What is embodied in the data? The underlying thesis, the thing that I've learned since I started at the Department of Public Instruction three years ago, is that your audience is often actually much smarter than you might think when you go into the room. And you should really think about how you can enable them to access that ability. Uh, in, in education, we're really lucky. Most of the people we work with in education leadership roles have had a lot of education. So you should see that as an asset. And how can you, you know, bring the data to bear to, to make them help, help them make better decisions? But the reason we don't all do this perfectly all the time is that there's very real barriers to our work. Uh, time, data, tools, and technology. And we've heard a lot about tools and technology. I'm gonna talk a bit about time and data as barriers very briefly. My boss always talks about something called yabats. He says a yeah but is what people say when you tell them what they should do. Uh, you lead them to a good decision, they first come up with a yeah but. So first yeah but we often have is that there's actually too much data now. And this is only gonna get worse in the next several years if you view it as a deficit. Um, you are gonna be faced with a lot more information or data to make information out of. So that makes it hard to get down and have that conversation about those key questions because you're not just analyzing assessment score data today, but you also have to analyze attendance data tomorrow. And maybe you have some survey data that needs to be processed. And, and so you're often pulled in different directions by these different data sources. The second yeah but is that there's too many different priorities. Uh, I feel this especially working uh, when the legislat legislature's in session. Our agency, you know, we are a service branch to the, uh, to the legislature too. So when they have questions, we got to get them answered quickly or they'll make a decision without the information. And so that's a pretty powerful reason to move quickly. Um, but, you know, they might have 20 different questions and they're going to take them all up in one long committee meeting on Friday. And it's Tuesday. Okay, well... You know, that makes it hard to sit and think really in depth about capacity and what the data can do. Uh, often we have different directions. We don't know what direction we're supposed to be going. We may be supposed to be going in two directions at the same time and then somebody else tells us to stop. So th these are very realistic concerns that you feel uh, when you're working with leadership. So the way out, or the way we try to, to organize our work in Wisconsin is we try to identify our goals in advance if we can, so we have some strategy to what we're going to do. We explore our data constantly, and we're always doing analysis so that we're ready. Uh, we focus 
narrow. We focus very narrowly when we talk with leaders because that way we're showing them leadership. You know, they don't ask me, can I please look at the data? They ask me, can you tell me what the data says about X? And so it's my job to actually answer that question, not to show them the attendance data. Uh, we try to find the context, as much context as possible that they are familiar with so that they can, you know, place this visualization into a decision-making space that they're comfortable with and understand. And we have to put it together well. Uh, one thing I always find uh, a bit of a challenge is when you prepare a presentation on data visualization, you have to prepare it for a projector which has a resolution of like nothing compared to your laptop. So I can make these beautiful presentations on high resolution and then I have to figure out how do I actually distill that down so it'll fit on a projector. So you have to realize that your presentation really does matter and it's really sometimes hard because you may be presenting to the legislature and they're lucky if they have a projector at all as we heard from Peter. So really you have to think about what's the final format going to be. So this is a map of Wisconsin. And this map shows the free and reduced price lunch population of the state from 2002 to 2012. The conclusion from this map is utterly obvious. This map uh, is something that we use almost all the time when we talk to schools, when we talk to leaders, we talk to legislators. The Wisconsin that most administrators in our agency worked in when they worked in school districts is not the Wisconsin of today. It's fundamentally different. It is purple today, and it was light purple in 2002. Um, the, the, the reality is that school districts in Wisconsin, the vast majority of them, have double or triple the percentage of free and reduced price lunch eligible students than they did 10 years ago. That may be within many teachers in that district's tenure. So 10 years ago, they were teaching a class with five kids in it who were free and reduced price lunch eligible. Now it's 15. That means that things are changing dramatically. The, the reason this works is not only is it have the mapping uh, component that people really do love to talk about maps and we try to map as much as we can, but there's a drama inherent in this map. You can watch this animation over and over again and look at different parts of the state and see what has happened to their student population and see how it's changing. And so that becomes a very powerful way to, we use it just to frame conversations. Let's start from this view. Things are fundamentally different than they used to be. So what are we going to do about it? What are we going to change? Uh, so I like to contrast it to this. Uh, uh, sometimes, you know, infographics have their place, but sometimes they can be very distorting. And they are all often very low information resolution. Uh, so here we have two numbers, uh, which would be two cells on our spreadsheet. Uh, with two labels, and it takes up the same space as that map did, which is composed of thousands of numbers. Uh, they're both easy to digest. The other one took me a long time to make. That map took uh, probably weeks to, to perfect. So when you have the luxury of time, you can do a lot more. So metrics and dashboards are for quick things that uh, there's not much data behind, or maybe there's a lot of data behind, but they're much more quick. Uh, something like that map takes a lot longer. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't try to stop the tide of word clouds in education. Uh, let me just unpack this. So take a minute, look at the graph. Oh, graph, I guess, is being very charitable. What did you learn? You learned that obviously in education were used a lot in whatever conversations were analyzed. Some other words were also used a lot. What did the colors mean? I don't know. That's not very clear. So what value did that really provide? Now, I'll be charitable and say you can provide a marketing value or it can provide a joke for my presentation, but a histogram or some other kind of textual analysis would have been much more useful for the same data. So you have to really be thinking about the context and the type of presentation. The other thing we try to talk about at our agency is the difference between exploratory and explanatory graphics. Exploratory graphics are what I use or my analysts use to understand the features of a data set. Explanatory graphics are polished and annotated graphics that convey a fact or an argument clearly. What we always say is never show your policymaker, your section chief or whatever an exploratory graphic. You're doing a disservice to them, you're wasting their time. You need to figure out what the meaning is, what, the what we're trying to say, and explain it to them and situate it in the context. 
And that way your meeting with them will be much more productive. If you have 30 minutes, you can cover a lot in a well done explanatory graphic. You won't be explaining, oh yeah, I forgot to label the x-axis, the x-axis is this. Oh yeah, the colors mean this, I forgot to put this legend on it. Oh yeah, the average score on this test is this, I forgot to draw that line. Like, you need to get all that context on the page. So here's an example of an exploratory graphic that actually has a lot of context already on it. Um, but it's hard to read. Uh, it's, it's something that means something to me inherently. Uh, what we're looking at is the relationship between the WKC, the Wisconsin Knowledge and Concepts Examination, our state summative examination, and the ACT on a, on a sort of distributional basis. But, you know, I could talk to you through this for the next 10 minutes and we would finally, maybe some of us would come to understanding, others would be frustrated. Instead, I'll just show you the money, which is, this is the distributions for several grades. I'm glad it shows up clearly on there with the colors. So the current, the black line represents the 97th percentile of students. The key here is that you can see two things immediately from this graphic. One is that low performing students do not outperform their percentile rank on the WKC. Their distribution is almost a straight vertical line. They are very much deterministically, when they score that low on the eighth grade test, their ACT score is going to follow almost perfectly. The other thing you see is that as you get more high performing, the distribution spreads out quite a bit. So just because you did great on your eighth grade math assessment does not mean that you're going to knock the ACT out of the park and get into your flagship college. There's still work to be done. The other thing that you can see is that uh, the ACT math benchmark is there in bright red. Uh, and you can see that at uh, the 97th percentile, all the students are above that. But most of the percentiles below that, which each curve represents, most of the students are not above that ACT math benchmark, even when they're doing well on the eighth grade test. The ACT math benchmark is a very high bar that schools aren't primed to think about. And it, it's set, supposed to say that you can get a C or above in credit bearing coursework in mathematics when you get to college. So eighth graders are not on the track to do that very well, even when they score well on our eighth grade math test. So that's a story that we really need to be able to tell. And the most important one is that there's, there's maybe this belief out there in Wisconsin that, well, you know, they were in the 20th percentile in the WKC, but we've got two years to get them up to speed before they're starting to think about taking the ACT. It's a done deal. It's a done deal in eighth grade. So what we have to do is why can't we shift our focus before eighth grade? We have to start earlier. It's too late by eighth grade. And that led to serious policy discussions in Wisconsin, that feature. And you wouldn't have got that feature if you looked at the means. If I just showed you the means of those students, you wouldn't have seen that there's just no variation for those groups of students. So, you know, one thing, you know, when I first started doing this, I, my goal was actually to educate the leadership at DPI and to say, you all have PhDs. Every one of you have appointed officials has a PhD. So I'm going to push you and we're going to do something complex. And you know, my immediate supervisor said, I don't think that's a good idea. You should go in with bar graphs. And I said, yeah, I mean, I think you're not doing a service to the leadership. We are really fortunate that we have such a smart audience. And I know that audience is smart. So instead of saying it's their fault if they don't understand the complexity, it's my fault if they don't understand the complexity. So how do we make it work that way? How do we provide them the context? How do we explain the graphic? How do we make the graphic accessible? Because if I can't make it accessible to them, then I'm not doing my job correctly. This is another one. It's an animation. And what you're seeing is the complete test history for the 2005, 2006, to 2010, 11 Wisconsin cohort of students. Um, each red line is a student. Uh, and they're binned by percentile, so we're moving up the percentile ranks and seeing how the students do. The yellow line is the average for that percentile, the median, actually. And the blue background is the proficiency levels on the WKCE, so the state proficiency levels. Uh, what I think is really powerful as this cycles through is that the yellow line never changes slope. It only changes intercept. So when we have students starting out in third grade in the the lower percentiles, they're not catching up ever. They are winding up in the same proficiency category that they started in. And in the bottom right, you see a histogram that shows you the proficiency levels that the students who started in that, per, that uh, percentile wind up at. So you can see that 
the far right is advanced and the middle is proficient, then we have basic and then minimal. It's all determined on that third grade assessment. Growth is not occurring. This graph was created because we had this idea at our agency that we were going to set these really ambitious growth targets. And we were going to say, you know, if students are starting off really low, then schools have to grow them four times as fast as a school student that starts off in the middle proficiency level. And I said, well, wait a minute. We can see if, it's, if any school has ever done that or any student has ever done that in the state. And what we decided is that if we set the, that kind of growth targets, we're not reflecting reality at all. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't set ambitious targets, but we need to be clear about that those targets are ambitious and how ambitious they are. The really th interesting thing I like to point out to practitioners is that a lot of practitioners focus on students just below the proficiency cutoff. And what I like to say is that you got to focus on kids just above, which is common sense to a lot of people, but kids who start just above a proficiency cutoff are just as likely to fall back down. Students don't travel in a straight line on this graph. They're all over the place. They fan out quite a bit, and year to year they move quite a bit. Um, so if they're on the edge of the proficiency level, they need work to ensure that they stay or grow out of being close to the border of that proficiency level. So it's a really complex graph. The, there's literally tens or hundreds of thousands of data points behind this graphic. And it takes a while to just look at it and think and look at it and think. But we learn a few things immediately. Mobility across proficiency categories is hard. The student growth is parallel across all the percentiles. Students regress as well as they grow. And our assessments are noisy. You can see that they don't all stay tightly around the median. They fan out quite a bit. And so students have different experiences making decisions about individual students on a year-to-year -year summative assessment is probably chasing the noise and not following the signal. So another crucial thing, we saw it in the last graph, but here's another graph, which is talking about context. Um, one of the projects that I work on, and I would love to talk to any of you about this if you're interested, is the dropout early warning system in Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin, we implemented as part of, as a reaction to that ACT analysis you saw where eighth graders were not performing on the ACT. We said we got to start targeting students earlier. We implemented a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade early warning system for high school completion. Uh, but one of the keys that I said when I started the project was that it has to be empirically accurate. We have to be upfront about how accurate it is. So we use what's known as an ROC or a rock curve. Um, what's important is that I can show this to leaders without ever explaining to them what a rock curve is, because here's what I say. All those little dots represent all the other early warning systems around the country. So all those little light gray dots. Some of them on the top left are the most accurate early warning systems that have ever been reported in the literature. The lines represent all the different models that we have tested in Wisconsin on our data for accuracy. And so you can see that one of ours intersects the most top left corner of the map. That means it's as accurate as the most accurate reported model in the literature. So then we can say, is that accurate enough for you as the executive leadership of the state education agency to say we should roll this product out statewide? The answer was yes, because I framed the discussion so that it would be yes. We are the most accurate. <laughs> So that's why context is important. If I would have shown them that without the context of the national literature, we wouldn't have really had a reason to make that decision. Education is littered with plots without context. And education is so full of context. We saw great context in the presentation that Peter gave, because here is the context of the community that the students are within. And students are living within families that have a context. And they're living within schools that have a context. And they're working in districts that have a context. So there's tons of context and reference points. And we have to do the extra work to bring them to bear. And it, it's what creates urgency and focuses decision making. And it moves the conversation beyond questions and into hypotheses or thinking about what we might want to do next. Uh, so here is my a blunt advertisement for the work we do in Wisconsin with R. Uh, you know, some of the vendors in the room could try to talk to me around, about moving their <coughs> positions on these graphs. But I, I like to think about whether or not there's speed involved in making the product and whether or not you can produce quality. Uh, and so you can see in the top left, we, I put Adobe Illustrator. It's really slow to make a graph in Adobe Illustrator, but it will be beautiful. So if you are in a world where you have time, you might want to consider that something that's going to be used a lot, you might want to make it in Adobe Illustrator. Uh, what we use, what you've seen today from me, are all of our graphics are done using R. 
it's fast, it's open source, and we can make the quality relatively high with relatively little amount of work. Um, but the problem is you gotta convince your staff to use it, so that is a huge downside. Um, the key is that you don't underestimate your audience. One polished graph is better than 10 non-polished graphs every time. You can fit a lot more information if you polish the graph, and you can lead people to the discussion points you want them to have if you think very carefully about every square inch of that graph. Um, the context is what you need to add to think about it. And the other thing is, you know, don't be shy about being strategic. Think about what your readership cares about and what's motivating the question. So they may be asking you about attendance, but why? Is it because there's an attendance initiative in the legislature? Is it because other states are doing some initiative on attendance? And how can you find contextual information to get more directly at that underlying motive? Another solution that I, I often encourage our analysts to do is to actually skip the data and just do simulations. Um, often trying to plot all the data can be too messy and really what we need are broad curves that ro broadly represent what's going on. Now in the state that's a real challenge because we do have a lot of data and a lot of it is noisy when we're trying to make state level policy. Um, so here what we, we do is simulating math growth and what I'm showing is uh, the bottom line is the average African American student from uh, a model that we fit to the data in Wisconsin. That's how they would grow in the average school. All the other lines represent above average schools. And we, what we did is we simulated how students starting out in different points would wind up if they went to an above average school. And that is a really powerful thing to say, here's actually the difference on the proficiency scale. Again, the context that edu uh, our policymakers care about if you see the, the average black student starts out just barely proficient, or just barely uh, basic actually, and winds up in the minimal category in 10th grade. Uh, if they go to a higher performing school, they either stay in the basic category or they can even move up to the proficient category. And so that's the difference, the visual difference between a, a, a regular school and an above average school. Uh, the other one I like to do is uh, model the counterfactual. There's a little bit of a lot going on here, but the, I tried to make it very simple. This was for our leadership team. The big arrow represents their goals, their stated goals for graduation in Wisconsin. We, we have a really high graduation rate, but not if you are African American or Hispanic in the state. So we said we're gonna close that gap. And then we set some ambitious targets. So I drew that, and then I drew the projected trend line for those, very basic trend line. And then I showed the actual data, which is the little points. And we're actually doing pretty well, except for our African American population, we're still not meeting that goal. But for our Hispanic and Native American population, we are on track for our goal since we set it. And so the, the focus is, when we have a discussion, is we don't need uh, initiatives for our, our other groups, we need to target our initiatives or our thinking around the group that's not meeting the goal. And why aren't they meeting the goal? And it's just showing that visual gap that if we continue the way we are, we're gonna miss our goal by about eight percentage points. And so are we comfortable with that or do we wanna change something? And so that's really thinking about what the counterfactual will be. So, you know, I hope that I've really shown you what we've done in Wisconsin. Um, and remember that this work has all been done with the executive leadership at the agency. And so luckily they tolerate me quite a bit. So I have had the luxury of having a lot, a lot of time to work with them. Uh, but it's also that we've really tried to think about what their needs and concerns are and how we can meet them with the data that we have available to us. Um, so if you're interested in the dropout early warning system, you can go to the first link there. That's, that's the page describing the work we've done in Wisconsin. Uh, you can email me. Um, there's some actually open source software, uh, R code, available for the early warning system. It's still being polished, but you can watch me actively screw it up and then fix it. Um, on GitHub, or you can go to my homepage, or follow me on Google Plus, or tweet me. I forgot my Twitter handle is at Jay Knowles. So it's been really a pleasure to talk to you, and I hope to have more conversations with many of you throughout the rest of the conference. Thank you.